This is part two of a sermon. So what I'm going to do for the first 15 minutes is repeat last week's sermon. <laughs> and, then, and then we'll move into this week's. Actually, I won't do that. Um, what I'd like to get right to is what jumped out at me when reviewing this text. It's a continuation of last week's reading. And the first words are, let love be genuine. And it's such a beautiful phrase. But it occurred to me, is this something that the Romans needed to hear? Is this something that by extension we, as people who still read this document and try and live by it, need to learn? What does it, isn't love inherently genuine? Last week, we read, Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, the emphasis is on living. Because, you know, it was a culture of uh, sacrificial worship where, uh, you know, animals were killed as part of uh, the offerings. And here, living is a very important word. It shows a value on the human life, the human capability to co-create with God a preferred reality on this earth. So... As far as today's reading goes, I look at, well, back to when on the, on, the, on the trail of that present yourself as a living sacrifice, I'm not my own anymore. I give myself to God. Well, what does this mean? This is an interesting area where psychology, theology, and philosophy certain schools all intersect and they talk about the construct of the human personality. So from birth, now Noah is just Noah. Right now the world revolves around him because he knows no better. That's developmentally where he's at. But as we grow up we start taking on pieces of identity. And as we grow older, we really start to do this with we take on our jobs or, as I said last week, roles with people. Who are we to other people? On a more subtle basis, though, we also develop parts of our personality to get a better hang on who we are. Who am I? And the problem with this is that the more we try and conceptualize the self, the more we try and create a character of ourselves, the more we occlude the fact that we are one in the spirit. We are one spirit. But we have this tendency to put up the barriers. This is who I am. This is who you are. And it's so much easier to hate the other than to recognize that they are part of the same spirit as us. Genuine love. If we put a lot of energy into our sense of self, okay, I'm the smart one, I'm the competent one, I'm the funny one, I'm the reliable one, I'm the responsible one, I'm the one who holds it together for the whole family, I'm the one who, 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 who. Then a lot of energy goes into the maintenance of that. And we rely on other people to affirm that. I can say all these things, but until 
Kurt says, Tom, nice shoes, I won't believe it. It, it, and unless somebody says, I love you, I won't believe I'm lovable. I'm reaching out. So I love those people only because they help me hang on to this image I want of myself. Capable, dependable, smart, whatever. And so our love for others is actually conditional because it is based upon how well they support what we actually want to love about ourselves. Family Systems gets really interesting about this because they say it isn't even the things that we consider laudable about ourselves. They say that if you look at a family, even people who say, I'm the difficult person of the family, I'm the troublemaker of the family, I'm the dour person in the family, I'm the one who provokes people, I'm the one that gets under people's skin, that they become so attached to that that they look to other people to bolster that even though it doesn't work for them. It doesn't make their life any more pleasant. And so, I would say a disingenuine love is one that says, I look to you, I love you, because you bolster what I love about myself, either because it's my preferred reality or because it's familiar. It's what I've known for years and I'm comfortable with it. And it gives me a sense of self. The self that we're asked to simply give to God. And when we give that self to God, we become this instrument. We become this tool through which God's wisdom, God's love can shine. And if we can clear that lens of all our projections onto it, here's who I am, here's who I want to be, here's who I really need to hang on to, then God's love can shine through. Then we can make the change that we've been called to make in this tradition. So for change to occur in this world as a result of our spiritual lives, great change must first occur in us. I have here the serenity prayer. Most people know it like this. Lord, help me to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. But there's more. Did you know? Did anybody here know there's more to this prayer? And it speaks directly to our text today. Anybody want to take a stab at it? All right. It goes on. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, Accepting hardships as the pathway to peace. Taking as God did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that God will make things, all things right if I surrender to God's will. That I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with God forever in the next. Amen. Now... The difficult concepts I read in this are accepting things as they are, not as we want them. I want a lot of change in my personal life, uh, my social life, my work life, the world. Um, Accepting hardship as as a path to peace, I hate hardship. Uh, It threatens my sense of security. The wall I've built around myself. Uh, All the things I've said, they're not right, wrong. They just are. They're just who we are. And then accepting the world as it is right now. Not as we would have it be. Can we trust that as individual souls, no matter who we are, we can change. 
things, but it may not happen overnight. And in the meantime, we have to recognize the world is essentially good. God created it. God called it good. There is so much that needs to be fixed in this world. And so we work on that. And we call other people and tell them, <laughs> change your ways. <laughs> Just give me trouble. Uh, all right. And back. So, the price of giving up this security. Of accepting hardship. Of accepting that things aren't going to be just as they are. Is small in comparison. To the gift that God offers us. When we remove the occlusion, when we step out of the way, when we surrender ourselves to God, then we live as Jesus taught when he said, do not worry about yourself. So, after telling people, let love be genuine, the author of this passage goes into some pretty tough material that will threaten the sense of our individual right. Our individual right to be the people that we want people to think we are. Love one another with mutual affection. That means we've got to love them back. Show honor. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. But here's then where it really, really gets hard. Bless those who persecute you. I don't want to. Bless and do not curse them. I want to curse them. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Why? That would feel good. Never avenge yourselves? Come on! If you're hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. Wow. I like to hang around people who make me feel good about myself. I don't say that proudly I think that's a weakness and I think here I'm called to be around people who drive me nuts and that's my spiritual act of worship offer yourself as a living sacrifice to God and then this passage ends with one of the more beautiful phrases of the Bible do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Overcome evil sounds like a violent concept. But if we allow ourselves to be a conduit for God's love, it's actually like depriving a fire of anger and hate of the oxygen it needs to survive. So this overcoming evil is not a battle. It's more like a dissipation. By removing from the equation the mutual animosity it takes to continue evil anger, hatred to flourish in this world. And so this gift of being a conduit of God's love is a gift available to each of us. It's a difficult one to receive, but it is such a blessing. So for peace, to prevail, for evil, or for good, to overcome evil. 
Let it start with each of us as individuals. And with the gift, the ability to love genuine that God gives us when we say, not my will, Lord, but yours. Amen.